Joy shared is joy multiplied. Pain shared is pain divided. When you sit in a room and talk to other people and get all your stuff out, it tends to make it dissipate. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who will not buy no fat ice cream, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 79 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate you and I'm excited that you're here with me. Did you join my email newsletter after I talked about it last week with the Eric Schrantz episode? I send out a weekly email just updating you on the podcast, what I wrote about my blog that week, and then most of the email is actually about a thought for the week, what I've been thinking about that maybe you have too. Others who've subscribed often ask me how I can read their minds, so I get it pretty relevant and I give you a challenge that I expect you to respond to me with, yes, really emailing me. And uh, it's going down pretty well. I'd love to have you be a part of the group and and you can sign up easily by going to tinamuir.com forward slash subscriber to hear more. So yes, last week we had Eric Schranz on the show. Eric is the host of Ultra Runner podcast and he's absolutely one of the go-to sources for media in the mountain, trail and ultra world. If you're involved in one of those, you definitely better go back and check it out. And even if you're not, Eric shared this wonderful story of his daughter, Sunny, running a mountain race. It went viral for a reason, so go listen. Now, today is an important one. We're talking to Matt Davis of Obstacle Racing Media, and you can guess what his business is all about. And yeah, we do talk about obstacle racing and why we should all give it a try. Yes, even me. But today's episode is about more than that. We dive deep into the topic of depression, and this is a powerful episode we all need to hear. I ask him a lot of the questions you may have been wondering, even if sometimes I do apologize, they come out as maybe inconsiderate or naive, but maybe it will help you understand if you're also kind of in the same situation as me that you haven't personally dealt with it yourself. Now, before I ramble too much, let's thank Aptive and Body Health and get right to the interview. This episode of the Running For Real podcast is brought to you by Aptive. Aptive provides audio-based workouts created by certified personal trainers available through a mobile app. New members get 30% off an annual membership by visiting aptive.com forward slash running for real. That's A-A-P-T-I-V dot com forward slash running for real. That's the number for running for real. Thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. Perfect Amino has been supporting me and my training for years now, and I need it even more now I'm trying to get back into running. I forgot how sore you get when you start running again, but at least I now have something in my corner to help me recover. Remember, coupon code TINA10 will get you 10% off at bodyhealth.com. Hello, Tina here. Just wanted to let you know that there is some choice words in this episode. There is some swearing. I have bleeped it out for you, but just wanted to let you know, just in case there aren't any little listeners around that you do not want to hear this kind of uh, language. So just wanted to let you know, enjoy the episode. Matt, my friend, thank you so much for joining me on Tina For Real. Tina For Real, this is not Tina For Real, this is Running For Real. You did not know I was going to say that. I am not going to edit this out because this is me being real. I do have a second podcast called Tina For Real, which is why I just said that, a daily podcast. But yeah, for anyone listening, welcome to Running For Real. Matt, welcome to Running For Real. For those of you listening, uh, Matt's face kind of looked at me with total confusion when I said that. So uh, you're not in the wrong place. This is Running For Real. Thank you for being here. But I'm but I'm glad that you're not going to edit it and fix it later. I love it, man. Just freaking roll. I'm not. I know. It, I'm getting more and more like this. Um, I do have a wonderful editor, Jeremy, but uh, more and more I'm kind of seeing it as just, it is what it is. Because <laughs> uh, it, it just feels feels more authentic. And, and we're definitely going to get into some authentic stuff today. 
Um, but firstly, you know, I had you on Run to the Top uh, a few years ago. We were just trying to figure out when that was, but I think it was a few years ago. All I remember is that it was coming up to the Bourbon Chase in Kentucky um, right. because John was preparing for that. So I want to say it was coming up to two years, maybe about two years. I don't know exactly. But either way, had you on a Unique Events podcast uh, a few years ago. Um, you are the face of Obstacle Racing Media, as said from your website. <laughs> this should be a video interview for anyone watching. Matt is definitely making some interesting faces. Um, you featured on in Rise of the Suffer Fest, which I was really excited. I told you this. I think I texted you at the time to say that I was actually um, on a plane on a Delta flight and I saw it come up and I thought, wow, this is so cool. So I watched it um, on a flight once and you're in it. Amelia Boone is in it. I, she's also another podcast guest and well done for that. So I'd recommend for anyone. Tell us, for anyone listening who doesn't know, uh, what is ORM all about? So the short version is I ran a couple of obstacle races back in 2012 like most of your listeners i was terrified slash intrigued mud obstacles electricity freezing water etc cetera, etc cetera. i did a couple of them fell in love with it decided for fun i would start talking about it with people the same way you're talking to me mm -hmm. uh, back in 2012 i thought let's do a podcast uh and then i fall into that category of people that started a passion that became my job and so you know, as the time went on, I became the quote unquote industry expert guy. I got to write a book. They put me in that movie and I'm, you know, the, the phrase I think people use now is just content creator, right? Mm -hmm. That's the sort of buzzword. So every, not all every day, but every week, uh, I create some form of content. So that's video, that's blog, that's podcast. And, uh, that's what we do. So if you want to know about that stuff, uh, obscuracy media would be your guide. Okay. So when you said about content creation, would it literally have you, would you write a blog post on this is how you overcome this particular obstacle? Like maybe, um, one that comes to mind, which probably you're going to hate. I use this example, like the monkey bars. This is no, how no, you no, do no, That's fine. Actually, that interesting. Interestingly enough, I've always been, and again, this wasn't the grand plan. This is just uh -huh. sort of how things have gone. I found that I'm not that guy. I'm more of like the everyday dad, right? So I would interview an Amelia Boone and say, how do you do this? Or I would interview, you know, a, a Ninja Warrior guy and say, how will you get better grip strength? I'm more of the first person. Here's how I did. This has been fun. And, uh, you know, my sort of wacky uh, voice, un <laughs> what's the word unfiltered voice is kind of what it is but then we have people come on who okay. do all that stuff right okay. but, but I'm, I'm not ben greenfield you know what i mean i'm definitely not like here's hacks to get your body right that's mm -hmm. definitely not my mm -hmm. not my jam okay well that's okay because we love what you do just as you are so <laughs> for anyone who hasn't done an obstacle race which i would guess most of my audience falls into that category why should they give it a try oh man it's um I've been asking people to do this because I'm writing, I'm actually writing an article now and uh, Ryan Atkins, who's a well-experienced obstacle racer said, um, you almost never regret trying something new, mm, right? True. So whatever the experience is for you, if you do as good as you wanted to, if it comes out about as well as you thought, if you do far worse, uh, either way, you're almost never going to regret it. It's nice to break it up. I can speak personally and say that I started running some five and 10 Ks this year, which I never do. And that's been a great way to break it up for me because that's mm -hmm. not my thing at all. I'm much more of a slow jogger mm -hmm. and uh, I take my time at obstacle races, but mixing it up with, uh, with five and 10 Ks has been awesome. Meet different kinds of people, have different kinds of experiences. So yeah, try an obstacle race. You won't regret it. Yeah, no, I, I want to. And I think you're, you're absolutely right, especially with something like that, where it is, it's one of me, one of those things that you look back on as a fun experience. And why do you think more people don't give it a try from the running world? I guess. I think the two biggest ones, well, if they're already in the, well, the people who don't do it fall into two categories. I'm not in shape enough or uh, I might get hurt. Mm. And I think even runners think they're not ready because they see pictures of Amelia Boone or some shirtless dude. And the truth is uh, you truly can't start at any level and you fail an obstacle. Great. Okay. I need to work on that next time. And that's about it. There's no people far, far, far worse shape than most runners try these things. So 
And the, and the thing about getting hurt, I can tell you, I've done 150 something obstacle races and other than a, you know, ankle or two that you could get running a road race, I've never had any major issues. Mm -hmm. But do you think any part of that is you talk about major issues again, bringing Amelia up, um, in a lot of this episode, but she comes to mind for me, like barbed wire, you know, not barbed wire, but like, you know, scrapes all over her body and people are like, Oh, why would I put myself through that? I know. But when you're doing it, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. Right? Like, when you, like when you look at somebody's injury, you're like, Whoa, but, but when you're out there, mm -hmm. I mean, there's really nothing. It's like trying to explain to somebody how you felt after your, you know, your PR marathon or something that just felt great to you. How could you ever put that feeling into like yeah. a bottle? Right. So, so same thing when you've come out of whether it's three miles or seven miles and you've been with your friends and like you're muddy and you're sweaty and you're like, Oh, where did that scratch come from? It's, yeah. it's an experience that you've, uh, that you won't regret. So no, that's I, think, fine. I think that's a good point. And I actually often, uh, we have this neighborhood near where we live and it's gated off and the gate keeps getting further and further down the, the grass to try and keep people out, but it's not keeping people out. It's keeping people in because I can get in using the code. I just can't get out again. So I always have to run through the bush and every single time I scrape myself and I barely notice it at the time. But then when I get right. home and I'm like, oh, ow, like it's sore, <laughs> but you know, at the time you're just running and you don't even notice. So I think it's kind of also a case of that. Like it might look painful, but when you're doing it, it like you said, you barely even notice. All right. So you reached out to me a few months ago saying that you wanted to kind of share your story and, and Matt, you know, reading more since you've told me, you know, I, I really want to say now, like on air, how, how brave it was of you, how much I look up to you for speaking out about something that isn't easy to talk about. Thankfully now is becoming more, people are becoming more aware, but you know, you said to me about, um, struggling with depression, a very important topic and something we haven't covered in depth yet on this podcast, maybe a little bit with Susie favor Hamilton, but with Susie, there's so much to cover that there's only so much time I could spend on it. Um, so tell me or tell us about what happened in December 2016 and how it kind of made your life like change forever. Sure. So as you can tell so far, I'm a pretty, uh, I don't know if the word is hyper. My, my wife likes to say like run hot. You know, this is sort of my general gregarious outgoing nature. And um, in December of 2016, um, I was... I was really like, I was waking up super early. Like I was waking up at like five in the morning and like, I'm getting so much done. I'm so productive. I dyed my hair blonde. Now I say to people, dyeing your hair is not necessarily a sign. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember of, seeing of, you have blonde hair actually. No. Of, of mania or bipolar. But in my case, I think it was. And it didn't seem that unusual because again, I'm kind of this super sort of hyper guy and, you know, I do a lot of wacky stuff. So what happened, um, what happens at the end of when, when somebody's bipolar, what they ha what happens at the end of sort of this manic period is the bottom falls out and it is a, it is a depression like no other. Now I'd heard the terms, uh, anxiety or anxious and depressed. I think people throw those words around a lot. And I think I had what I like to call garden variety, putting my hand like this, like a level, like garden variety, anxiety, and depression, meaning I would maybe lose a little sleep over a check not coming or am I going to get this job? Right. And then, you know, some days you feel a little blue, like whatever. Like I just thought these is part of life, but I, I like literally like couldn't get out of bed and it, it was, it terrified me because it was so new to me. Is it just completely random? Like one day it just kind of yes. like a switch? Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, maybe it was, maybe the days leading up to it was a little more gradual, but, um, I, I literally like taking a shower was work. Like I would, I would call my wife who was working out at the gym and I'd say, okay, honey, I'm going to get in the shower now. She's like, okay, honey. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm going to call you when I'm done taking a shower. Like it really was that difficult. Like the world seemed really scary. And I think the phrase that, that, that really, resonates the most with me is not trusting my own thoughts because the rational brain says this isn't right. Right. And fighting it, by the way, doesn't like, that's not the answer, but that's what my brain is saying. I feel so horrible. Why do I feel so horrible? Why am I afraid of getting out of bed? Right. Like, and that just perpetuates it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went to see a doctor. I tried different meds. I tried different meds and some of them make it like worse. Um, and just every day I would wake up with this thought of 
dear God, please, you know, go away because I couldn't, I, I think I told you in an email, uh, I was going to go to tough guy, which is this, you know, sort of granddaddy of them all mud yeah. runs that started in England in, in 1980. And this was a huge thing. I bought my tickets. I was finally going to go to tough guy and there was no way I was getting on a plane. I mean, I could barely leave my house, let alone get on a plane. And if you know me, you know how badly I wanted to go on that trip. And the part that's, that's important for me to talk about is that I did start talking about it. And on my podcast, which is about obstacle racing, I started telling people that I was suffering and I knew a few people would comment, you know, like, and I posted on Facebook and I knew a couple people would comment and say, you know, cheer up, get better or whatever. But I had no idea the overwhelming support that came through because so many people have lived with it or live with somebody you know, I, I got emails that are like, listen, I don't have that, but my wife does. And I've been this, been through this with her. Um, so I am so much more appreciative and grateful of my mental health. Whereas before I think I would just be grateful that like, Hey, I'm healthy today. My stomach doesn't hurt. But the fact that my, my brain, I can trust my brain again mm -hmm. is, is, is what's the most valuable thing to me. Yeah. Well, and you went through, you know, a lot of work, which we'll talk about in a minute. You just mentioned you did try meds, but we'll, you know, you, you went through more than just that, which we'll talk about in a second, but just kind of backpedaling to when it was kind of going on, you know, you mentioned calling your wife before and after you got out of the shower. Um, you know, did your wife notice something straight away or was it kind of a, a case of you trying to hide it? Could you even hide it? Um, you know, before you spoke publicly about it, who, who did you tell and, and how did you go about that? Well, like I said, she, we look back now and we can see the signs, right? We can see these sort of like, you know, the highs and lows of being bipolar. And so now I think we would, now we kind of know what to look for, which was like, so this is what I say to people. Like they say that crazy spending is, is one of the telltale signs of, of a manic episode or mania. Like people like get on a plane and go to Paris. Right. And I'm like, well, I never got on a plane and went to Paris, but I was driving around town to all these different targets, trying to find different Funkos to buy. Do you know what Funkos are? No. <laughs> these little <laughs> toys, these little toys that are, that have, they're for different characters. Your listeners may know, and you can look it up later. The kids, right? Oh no. Yes. Okay. Yes. But you can like flip them on eBay and it's a okay. whole thing. And the fact that I was spending my day doing that and not working like makes no sense. Like there's no, there's no reason I should be driving all over town to targets 30 minutes away from each other, trying to find these different things. So again, it wasn't until like one day that I couldn't get out of bed and that I, you know, my wife had to take care of the kids a thousand percent that we kind of realized how bad a shape I was in. Mm -hmm. And, and your three kids, Emma, Jackson, River, you did, did you, did any part of you try and hide from them what was going on or, or could you even hide it? You know, it, it's hard to talk about, right. Cause they're not quite, old enough to really like get it. It's just like, you know, daddy's sad. So I remember the first day she took me to the car wasn't working or something. So she, or one of the cars wasn't working. So she, she actually dropped me off and it was like, yeah, daddy's going. Um, and I think maybe they had kind of a thing. I mean, my son is actually now on meds as well, which is another story, but I think, so they kind of get that, but yeah, I mean, I used to, one of the things, um, uh, one of the things that was recommended to me was the book. Um, oh man, now I can't think of the name of it. Um, super better. Have you heard of that book? Nope. But I can put it in the show notes. Please, please do. Uh, so super better Jane McGonigal. She talked about game playing. She had her own depression from this head injury. And I started playing, uh, part of my routine was I played angry birds with my daughter every night. And that was like amazing. Like it's just this 30 minute window that I looked forward to that helped. And I think she kind of knew that maybe. So wait, you did keep doing it throughout playing, doing the 30 minutes with. Yeah. Dad. Yeah. And it, it was honestly, it was a distraction. Um, but again, I think, I don't know if maybe when she gets older, she'll know that's part of the reason why I was doing it. But the, the game playing helped me. You asked about, you know, running and I'm telling you like anybody that suffers with it knows, but it's so hard to explain because your brain says, just go out the door, just get out the door and you'll be okay. Just get out the door and run. And this other part of your brain is like, no, we're all doomed. You're going to die. I mean, it's so hard to even explain, 
Uh, and then I would run like for 45 minutes and maybe, you know, during that time, my brain would shut off a little bit, not a hundred percent, but at least a little bit. Um, and then I would do that again at the end of the day. So once you got out the door, once you physically left the door, that kind of helped a little bit, or was it that whole time you mostly are still thinking, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Most of the time you're thinking that the world is horrible and you're going to die and it's all useless. I mean, the, the, the way the best I heard depression explained once was depression feels like, like you've been lit in on this big secret and the big secret is that we're all doomed and we were f-ed. so like all these people walking around smiling, getting coffee, they don't know the truth. Mm. And the truth is that life is meaningless and that we're all going to die. Like it's really, it's crazy, but it doesn't make it, it you know, th- they, that's why if you read, you know, anything about depression, they tell you like, you just got to do one thing. You just got to like, get out of bed. Okay. Now just get yourself to the kitchen. And then as you do those, those things get easier and easier. But I remember even just going to work was scary for me. Even when I like started going back to work, it was like, okay, I'm going to go, hope it's not too scary. And then it, and then, you know, the day would go on and it would come up a few times. And, you know, I can tell you that when I, I think the first, I don't know who the first person was to like commit suicide, like shortly after I went through this, but I totally got it. And I remember thinking about like Robin Williams specifically, because it's not necessarily, I'm so sad. It's, I will do anything to turn this off that I'm pointing to my head. Like, what can I do to turn this off? And if the answer is kill myself, shut this down. Like that's the only way to shut down those voices I mean, I I know this is like not pleasant to speak about, but like that's... No, but I think it's important to to mention and and to kind of allow people like myself and others who maybe haven't, you know, I've had family members who have been on antidepressants, but I don't don't feel like anyone was quite at the, the level to what you're talking. And so it's good for people like me to understand because you know, once we get it, then, then we can obviously be more sensitive around things. We can recognize it in other people and, um, so I want to kind of unpack this as much as we can to kind of, you know, promote awareness because the more we can get this awareness, the more we can prevent, you know, situations like Robin Williams, hoping, um, that, you know, people can get help before they get to that point. And, and you did get the help. So, you know, let's tell us about, um, about that. You went to an outpatient program. So what, what does that involve? <laughs> so, um, when you go to get evaluated, right. By one of these places, right. Sometimes they will like admit you, right. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're a danger to yourself and others. We are going to admit you, right. Which it's not, you know, it doesn't look like cuckoo's nest, right. It's not like that. There's no like straight jacket. (laughs) I know that's bad to say, but that's kind of what comes into my head. (laughs) But trust me, I think like I said to my wife and this goes to show like where my head was is that when my wife said to me, I'm really concerned you're not getting better. I said to her, like, please don't call the police on me. Like, which is of course my wife would never do that. But like, that's where my head was Mm -hmm. because you can have someone admitted, right? 5150 as they call it. Right. And they were my, when I went, they were like, Hey, we don't think you need to stay overnight, but it's going to be this like going at nine, leave it for thing. Right. And it's kind of like what you've seen in the movies, right? It's group therapy, it's classes as they call them. And of course I hated it. The first two days I told my teacher or my, my cat, whatever, like, this is horrible. This is stupid. What am I doing here? I don't have the same problems as these people. It's really easy to say all that stuff, right? Because mm-hmm. there's people with like more severe issues, people that talk to themselves, people that hear real voices, but uh, it's just an immersive experience to kind of help you kind of get back to the world and it, and it works. I mean, I will give a shout out to Ridgeview, the place I went to here in Georgia. I think they were phenomenal. Um, they just know how to deal with people. The thing people always ask, you know, I think kind of what you're getting to around, like, what do you say to someone? And the truth is there's nothing to do, but love the person. That's really all you can ever do and, and meet them where they're at. You know, I had a friend call me, my brother's gone through this. Can you talk to him? And I'm like, sure. But like, if he's willing to call me great, but it's not, you know what I mean? Like there's nothing you as the family member can do other than say, you know, what would you like? How can I help you today? Because you can't tell somebody, Hey, cheer up. You can't make someone go to try to get therapy. Right. So you just got to kind of be where they're at and hope Mm -hmm. that they come around. It's kind of like, think of it as someone with an alcohol problem. You can't make them not drink, 
you can just be where they're at and decide kind of your level of interaction with them and, and that you're available if they need you. Now, a lot of us listening, I know I am definitely, uh, could be described as pushy. And I know <laughs> that I um, definitely, I wouldn't say interfere, but like if someone I knew was close to me was really going through this, I would find it very difficult. Like you just said the example of, can someone talk to you? I would probably dial the phone and then hand it to the person and say, hey, they, they want to talk to you. So like, but that's me interfering and kind of taking it a next step. Would you say to be very careful in that situation for someone listening who thinks maybe they're kind of like that too, that there's only so much you can do and don't try and take this on as your problem to solve? Correct. Okay. Do not take it on as your problem to solve. Okay. Is there anything else you would you would <laughs> add to that person? Because I feel like I would just struggle to just um, kind of... Say, okay, you know, I'm here for you, I love you, but then not do anything else. I feel like I would need to cut. What else would you say? That's it, man. That's that's where the rubber meets the road. Have you <laughs> heard of a have you heard of a program called Al Anon? No. Okay. So <laughs> Al Anon was developed by the wives of alcoholics, right? Because they have this person who's addicted to alcohol or drugs and what do they do? Mm -hmm. And the answer is always, uh, pretty much nothing because there, there is nothing you can do. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if you, it's like, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a great example or not, but let's say you had a friend who was looking for a job and they didn't want to look for a job and you go, well, I'm going to call that company and put you on the phone with them. And you ask them for that job, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe if you put them on the phone, maybe they'd actually talk to them, but you're not really, solving the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and dude, trust me, it's super hard. It's really hard to watch somebody struggle and here. So here's, but here's the, you just reminded me of the most important piece that, that made the shift for me. If someone's listening, that's, that's struggling is when I went to, uh, when I went to the, um, the treatment place and I was in one of the classes the, the case manager lady, you know, you're in a group of people. And she said to somebody else, not even to me, she said, how are you contributing to your illness today? And, and I heard that. And what I heard was how am I contributing to my recovery today? Because I wasn't at that moment, I was waiting for something to fix me. You know, I was waiting for the medicine. I was waiting for God. I was waiting for my wife. Like somebody else was going to make me feel better. And there, the only way out is through, and I was the only one that was going to make me better. And when that, when that, I wasn't ready to hear that before maybe, but I was. And so that plus meds, plus exercise, you know, plus, 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 they talk about, you know, when you're in these places, they say, okay, what can you do? What works for you? And some people are like, well, I like to go for walks. Great. Me just playing with my kids. All, you got to stay on top of that stuff before you get there. Because then when you get there, it's kind of too late. Like you can go for a run or whatever. Like, I mean, I don't know about you, but like, do you find like if you've been super cranky because you haven't run in two days? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Or if like, okay, so it's not necessarily if, if I haven't run in two days because I went that, you know, three months without it. But if something stops me that I didn't have any control over, then yes. If something was, stops you like Or like what? if a situ if a, you know, I was, something happened and I couldn't get out to run or I was injured. Like I didn't have the control over the situation. Right. So yeah. so yeah. So, um, it's, it's really tough, you know, to watch someone struggle. I, I totally get that because we want to make them better, like so bad, but yeah, you gotta just, you know, give them a hug and let them know you're there and then let them, be, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can suggest things. I mean, like I said, so the funniest thing I talk about is like when I talked, when I came, when I came out, my message box blew up and I got all kinds of recommendations, right? Have you tried this meditation app? Have you tried this book? Right. But then I had people who said, you know, Matt, all you need is Jesus. And that was not the answer I wanted to hear or needed to hear because Jesus isn't the answer for me, but you know, whatever, they were coming from a good place. So <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that kind of goes to show that, as you said, it is so individual. This is what worked for these people. Uh, each person was able to give their, what was the, changing moment for them and maybe what you just said a few minutes ago about what are you doing towards your recovery maybe that will kick a few people listening um you know to to get better and do something about it but maybe other people it won't so I think that kind of proves that you know it is so individual and 
for someone listening, what would you say if the things to recognize if a family member or a friend is kind of headed down that path, but isn't quite there yet, what things would you say to kind of pay attention to? I think, I think lacking in communication is always a big one. So if they're avoiding your calls and texts, maybe it's something. I mean, I think there's, there's definitely a, a like a level of healthy, like I'm going to just not answer anybody for like a day stuff that we all do. But if you have a friend that typically talks to you, I think the, the question is like, if somebody, if somebody has been avoiding you, you go, Hey, just checking in. I haven't heard from you. And if they say, no, I'm fine. You may want to ask a couple times, right? Like, come on, you can, you know, you can talk to me really. It's okay. And if they go, well, I have such and such going on. But again, even if they tell you, all you can say is, is there anything I can do for you today? Is there anything I can do to help? Not, well, you should go get treatment or, you know, you can ask a friend, are they taking their meds? Interestingly enough, that's like number one on the list. When people say like, where did things go wrong? Stop taking my meds, stop exercising, stop blah, blah, blah. So, um, <laughs> that's a big one though, because people, people always, it's interesting that people always like, well, I, I took these meds that made me better. I'm better now. I don't need the meds anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good to know, because I th I'm sure if, if you said that is a common one that the people listening, if you are on meds have been considering at some point <laughs> stepping away and, and maybe that isn't the right thing to do. Don't stop taking your meds. Okay. <laughs> good to know. Um, all right. What about, um, you know, when it comes to any other pieces of advice before we talk about, you know, you speaking out about this, any other pieces of advice you would say for someone listening who is going through this right now? I mean, realistically though, would, would you be listening to a podcast like this or would the, would you kind of be, have been at the stage where you were like, well, what's the point of even listening? So would someone be listening? I, I mean, I can tell you that I didn't even understand, like I said, when I, when I heard someone say they're depressed, I would kind of be like, well, you should probably get over that sad sack. You know what I mean? Like I just, I, I've, I've the biggest, I got so much compassion from, from going through this and I'm someone who needed like a big dose of compassion, I think. So you never know. I mean, this, if this hits somebody at the right time and they decide to go get help for themselves, awesome. Right. Or somebody might, you know, message me or message you after listening to this and, and thank you just talking about it. I think, you know, what you're doing is great. Like you want to bring attention to it. You want to help people come from that genuine place is awesome. And, um, if not, you know, then you've got 700 other episodes that they can listen to. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, things have caught me in the right day at the right time. Somebody says, go listen to so-and-so. I'm like, I don't want to listen to that guy. I don't give a shit. Or he's never been my cup of tea. And then on the right day and the right time, I catch that episode and it does something for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't listened to Anthony Robbins in 10 years and I heard something on him yesterday and it, it helped me. Oh yeah. Wait, is that Tony Robbins? Yeah. I'm sorry. What did yeah, I call yeah. him? Anthony. I mean, maybe that oh. is his name. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he is. Tony is short for Anthony, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love him, but I'm a complete cheese ball when it comes to that stuff. So I'm not. Uh... Well, dude, I am too. And that's the other thing is that when people ask me about knowing to get help is that I, I am someone that's done a lot of self-help over the last yeah. 25 years. So a long time, I've taken a lot of seminars. I've listened to a lot of tapes. So for some people going to the, going to the treatment center is a massive leap. Yeah. For me, it wasn't as big, but it was still pretty scary. And is this something you, you really cannot do on your own? You need to, if you are listening to this and you're in the thick of this, or you know someone who is like getting help is going to be the only way this is going to kind of, you're going to be able to see out the other side. I'll give you a trite, since you like cheesy things, I'll give you a cheesy okay. saying, right? Joy shared is joy multiplied. Mm, okay. I like that. Pain shared is pain divided. Hmm. So when you sit in a room and talk to other people and get all your stuff out, it tends to make it dissipate. Makes that's sense. why. Yeah, that makes sense. That's why group therapy works. That's why 12 step programs work. So I suppose you could do it on your own, but that's not what worked for me. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. All right. Let's talk about, you know, um, before we get to you actually sharing your story, you told us that you you know, told what was going on on your podcast, but was there any part of you that, you know, you being seen as this tough guy who does these obstacle races and all these kind of, you know, um, really gritty races, 
um, you know, all kinds of challenges. Did any part of you feel before you said anything that it was all a lie? Like you felt like you were like tough on the outside, but you had to put on this persona when you're struggling so much behind the scenes. Did did you struggle with that at all? Or was it, uh, did you completely pull away from ORM when this was going on? Well, I, I pulled away so much that I had a friend reach out to my wife, you know, and again, like talking about what to look for, you know, my friend Keith, um, I'm in a chat with him and a couple other guys and we talk a thousand times a day, crack jokes, crack on other people. I don't know if, if you're familiar with any of those, if you have friends that you, if I have friends, well, thank you very much. <laughs> If you have, if, if you I have, have friends. A, if, if you have friends that you enjoy, yes, I do uh, have some group chats. Yeah. If that's what you okay. Mm-hmm. Sending memes to et cetera. Yeah. Um, so he messaged Stacy because I wasn't like answering in this group and I thought about it for a couple of days. Like maybe I should just come out and say something, but for what, you know, I, it's hard to remember. I just know that once I did, once I posted on Facebook, it felt like a massive relief. Mm. And then I started talking about it on the podcast. And again, like I just did it because I thought it would be, it would just, it would just let my people know what's going on. But I'm telling you, I've had people approach me at races and say how much it meant to them. And again, I'm not, I've never been, I've never set out to be the inspiring guy. I've never set out to be the make your life better because you listen to me guy. And so I was floored and still am. Um, and again, it instantly gives me compassion to those people, but no, of course it's super scary, super duper scary to tell someone, you know, I can't get out of bed. I can't, the shower is scary to me. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think that's good for you to mention. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of other people who completely understand what you're saying right now. And again, just sharing is, is making them not feel so alone. And that is what this podcast is all about. So thank you for for telling us this and sure um so you know you mentioned to me when when we spoke um through message that um being public funny and outgoing matt has been tough to come to grips with depressed as fleet matt um <laughs> so i haven't decided if this is going to be a clean or if i'm going to beep your your swear words out yet so we'll, have i, I been interesting you have been, but it's okay. I'm not sure if I'm going to beat them out yet. So I might have a warning at the beginning of this episode for anyone listening. Um, but yeah, tell us about what you meant by that, like coming to grips with it. Well, again, like I have a, I have this idea of myself, right? Fun, outgoing, emotions on my sleeve, like kind of a guy, right? And I didn't know anything but that, right? If I did, if I was sad, I sort of kept that myself. Right. Um, so like, it's totally okay. Like it's totally okay. If I have a day that I don't want to work or I don't want to be with people or, you know, whatever. And again, like, that's the big part of it is that my brain isn't doing what it's doing before, which is like, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. It's like, Oh, I'm having a son of a rough day. Why don't I like go watch TV. And I've had those days, right? I mean, certainly part of my brain is like, get up and do some work, get up and do some work. I mean, I think you're, you do, you consider yourself an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. On your busiest day ever. Like, don't you go to bed going like, I I could have sent two more emails. Every day I go to bed like that. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm, I take it a lot easier on myself now when it comes to that stuff. Now we can also go completely the other way and be like, you know, let's, let's F off all day. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's, I mean, if I had to work for someone, like if I had to go to a job when I was going through it, I don't know what I would have done because I don't know how I would have struggled through it. Um, but what was the question again? I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, I was asking you about, you know, um, how usually you're funny and outgoing in public and you had to kind of come to grips with, you know, being depressed and kind of that not being who you were at that time. Yeah. I mean, again, like it just, it's just, it's made me, it's just made me an overall, I feel like it's just overall made me a better person because people that know it, it like, it just shows people that you're real, you know I mean? I don't know. Do people, when you've met people, have they acted pleasantly surprised that you were just as genuine, just as genuine in person? Yeah. All the time. <laughs> right. And you're like, why wouldn't I be? What did you expect me to be this horrible? Right. 
But I think people, you know, we're in their ears or on their computer screens and they don't know. And then they can touch and feel us and be like, oh, wow, you are a human too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, I get <laughs> And I, I mean, I'm just as guilty as anyone else feeling, you know, when I see someone who I look up to, like, oh my God, that's that person. And then when they're nice, being like, they're actually really nice, as if I you know, expected them not to be. But yeah. Um, and, and I think you're right. And as you know, this podcast is all about being real and being, you know, open and honest. And, you know, in the opening to this podcast, um, the words say, you know, about not feeling alone. Um, so I think this is definitely a relevant topic. And um, I'm I'm so glad we have talked about this. And, and just finally, to kind of wrap up running, coming into it, you mentioned about getting out the door, about it giving you a little bit of an escape. Um, so did you run when, when you were at the, at your absolute worst? Yes. Like you did, that was one thing you did make yourself go do. Yeah. And I had to, and I only ran three miles, you know, quote unquote, because it was like the shortest loop around my neighborhood. If I'd gone further, maybe it would have been better. I think I was afraid to go that far away from the house. Now that I think about it, I think that was probably it. I didn't even put that together, but like, you know, you want to stay really close, you know, like your world is very small. Okay. And people who aren't listening, who can't see me, I'm putting my hands together. <laughs> Your world is so tiny. Um, and I was like, just get up. And then when I would, it, it's not like, hooray, I feel better. But again, like the mind would just shut off a little bit. It was also freezing. I remember that. So it was January and I was effing freezing, which is by the way, even worse, right? Like, I don't know about you, but for me, if it's hot, <gasps> go run. If it's cold, oh, the bundling up. And then how much do I bundle? Because if I get too hot on the run, it's going to suck. <laughs> and I, so I definitely remember putting the face thing on. And then as I ran, you know, you drop that. And I also remember, it's funny, people in the morning on the way to work would wave to me, I think because they were like, there goes that guy running. <laughs> Good for you. He must be have his stuff all together. Right, exactly. It's it's 18 degrees and he's running. Where are you? Where do you live again? Virginia? Kentucky. Kentucky. <laughs> so close. I don't know how cold it gets in the morning here, but um but yes. Probably a little ex- colder than you, but not too much. Exercise is great for the millions of reasons we all know it's great, mm-hmm. right? Outside, away from screens, endorphins heart rate, blah, 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 blah. It's like, duh. Right. It's like, why do we all like, why, you know? So yes, running absolutely helped me. And, uh, I, I would, I can't imagine my life without running. I really, I truly can. So I don't know if you're going to have the experience or the, like, if you, this is something that you go through, but I know that we've had other people who I've spoken to who have suffered with depression, do struggle with it and running becomes, that escape, the thing to do to kind of, um, make yourself feel better. Like you mentioned, maybe just for a little bit, but then it's easy to kind of go too hard, maybe run harder than you should be because you want to think about the pain rather than, you know, what's going on in your head. Um, I don't know if you would have experienced this, but is there any advice for, um, making it the focus be getting out there and moving and exercising? Um, Joe Denoy, who I had on the uh, mini podcast episode I was telling you about before, he talked about, you know, just get out and move, just move your body. Um, but I know people tend to take it to the extreme, except, especially runners. Do you have any advice on that or did you not really have to deal yeah, with Yeah, that's not, I, I don't know that I've ever been accused of, of working too hard. I'm, 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 <laughs> I like to keep it. I've only recently started getting my heart rate up there. Mm-hmm. Like I said, running. Uh, but you know what happened was I also like gained a bunch of weight. Um, so uh, I like force myself to get out there and try it. But yeah, that's not my, that's not okay. been my experience. Okay. Just thought I would check in with that. Um, and maybe I'll have someone else, uh, you know, see if they can speak to that next time we do kind of cover this topic. But what about now? What is, what does day-to-day life look for you now? You mentioned you're still on meds uh, you know, is running a part of it? Um, how have things changed now? So as I said, it, it, it's all, uh, it's all sort of a big soup, Right. And, and what are the things that sort of go in your soup? And they all like, like, um, running makes it better. Yoga makes it even better. Yoga and meditating, meditating once a day makes it better. Mm-hmm. Meditating five times a week. Make, like, right. So right now, like my meditation is, is not, has not been great, but that's a big one I would say. And here's a little trick for people. Uh, meditating does not have to mean, um, your mind is shut off. Mm. 
and you're right. So there are so many, so I will make a recommendation to put in the show notes. Uh, many people use either calm or headspace, yep. which, are, which are great, great, great apps. Um, but they cost after a certain period of time. Insight timer is what it's called or insight. Is that is spelled I N S I G H T? S I G H T. Is that is that a perfect Tina impression, by the way? Well, I don't know. You'll have to ask the listeners. I wouldn't say that was perfect, but okay. you can work on it. Is literally thousands of free apps. So it sorts by how much time you have. Do you have five minutes? Do you have 20 minutes? Do you want music or no music? Do you want to be talked to or not talked to? Do you want to do uh, get fresh for the day or do you want to do something about money? Like, I love it, love it, love it. And what I typically do is I put one on and I start, you know, breathing or whatever. And I'll usually fall asleep, honestly. And that's not bad to reset your body like that. So if I meditate, if I set the meditation and it's 10 minutes, but I set my alarm for 20 minutes because I know I'm probably going to fall asleep. Great. I've reset the day. I wake up. A super healthy person would just then get back to work. I typically then go to Dunkin' Donuts, get a nice coffee first. And then I continue on my day. So that's a huge one. And then, uh, gratitude lists for me are phenomenal. Yes. Again, I'm not, I'm not the first one to, to do this, but I wake up every day. Oh, I thought of a good one. So I write down 10 things. Okay. So here's what's important with this. They do not have to be earth shattering things. Yes. Uh, if I can't think of anything, it might be this coffee that I'm drinking, my phone, right? It can be that simple, right? Or like someone holding a door open for me. That's the example I use. Like someone, I, yeah. I have friends, that, and this is another one. I highly recommend getting at least one buddy that you'll do this with because it helps to do it. Like as soon as I take the picture, I send it. I send it to like three different groups that I'm in because I keep meeting people who ask me about it. And I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, let's let's start a group together. Um, and I'm not perfect every day and neither are they. But it doesn't matter, right? Because but you one take a picture of your gratitude list every day, right? And, and I that's what you that. send on, okay? Right, and and sometimes that guy might just type it back, or he might. But like I, some of the stuff they've given me, I got my friend wrote one today. Uh, my teeth can crunch food, right? Yeah. I mean, right? Like simple, <laughs> like it's, but it's, it's true. <laughs> better than having a mouth full of like gums or whatever, right? <laughs> Which um, I watch my baby trying to gum things. So we'll see. There you go. <laughs> and I and I try not to be lazy about it because I can be super lazy. Yeah, like getting. If them. I did my wife and kids, that's four out of ten right there. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to go that angle, I try to be specific. Like you know, my wife's kindness, my son's laugh, or whatever it is. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be massive sun, moon, and the stars all the time. But again, it, there's some magic in doing it every day where. If I miss a day, I don't kill myself for it, but just getting up every day. And by the way, this is a tough one. Before you turn this on, before nice. you lay in bed and do this, get up, put the coffee on, sit down, which in my house is really hard because my kids are already up and screaming about something. It's really hard to be grateful when they're screaming, but I do it most days. Yeah. Okay. That's really good. So just to clarify there, Matt was showing his phone. So before you start scrolling on Instagram or log into Facebook, then... Do your gratitude list there. I and dare I you. I, I dare you, dare you, listener, tomorrow morning when you get up, put the phone somewhere besides next to your bed and not turn it on and check anything before you do your gratitude list. I dare you. It's and really then hard. take a picture of your gratitude list if you are brave enough and either send it to myself or Matt if you can tweet it, if you can put it on on your Dude, social media or whatever. That would then be awesome. We would love Look to see you. that. Look at you. Look at you getting interactive with it. And we're going to get your social media stuff in a minute so they can send it to you. All You're right. like a professional person. A professional person? You're like a professional That's person. Wait, a, wait, a, <laughs> wait to bring it to the audience. You're such a professional. <laughs> I like connecting people and this is this is a cool way to do it. Um, okay, so just to, to kind of wrap up here, um, is there anything else you would say um, to people listening right now to, to keep in mind or anything just about spreading awareness? Like, is it, you know, you've already talked about how good it is to talk um about it, but most people listening aren't going to have a platform like you or I to kind of share and have that feedback of people reaching out um, and saying, I've been through this. How would someone go about it if they are just, you know, living their day-to-day -day life and don't have that, you know, um, network of loyal supporters? Right. I, you know, one thing I forgot to mention was there was one guy that I called every day. So it's funny because now that I think about it, it shows where my day was. So I would wake up, I might run 
And then I would go back to bed because life was too scary. And I would sleep until like 10 and then I would get up and make my eggs. And while I was making my eggs, I would call a friend. He was, so when all those people reached, when I posted on social media and all those people commented, the, a few people like stood out like, okay, I should call this, you know, this person seems like a good friend or whatever. Anyway, we'd never been friends before. We'd only been social media buddies. And he became like my rock. I called him every day at 10. And sometimes I would talk about how I felt. Sometimes he'd talk about his past experiences, but I don't think you need a network. I really think just one person, whoever you're close to. So it could be, it could be a, like a parent or a sibling. It could be just like that one friend that you can buy your stuff into. I feel like we all need that, right? We all need at least one person in our life. Um, and I think it probably shouldn't be your spouse because sometimes your spouse is the source of that issue. So you don't want to go to them with my wife is driving me crazy. Right. <laughs> or my husband is a selfish. <laughs> right. So try to find someone other than your spouse if possible. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. We are just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the running for real four. By now, you've heard me talking about how much I love Body Health Perfect Amino for recovery. But did you know that if you try it and don't like it, you can get your money back? 100% of it. That's how confident they are in what they are making and how much it will help you to recover. And hopefully by now, you know how much I appreciate it, especially as I'm trying to get back to running after having a baby. And let's just say things break down a little bit easier than they did before. So I definitely need them to help me stay healthy. Perfect Amino is made of the eight essential amino acids our bodies need them to function. And this will help it kind of work as it should be. And as a vegan sourced, non-GMO, gluten-free, soy and dairy-free product, you don't have to worry about food allergies affecting your ability to recover. So with marathon season fast approaching, give yourself the best chance of getting to that start line healthy as those intense workouts and accumulated miles begin to take their toll. Remember, you can use coupon code TINA10 to get 10% off at bodyhealth.com. What do you have to lose? This episode of the Running For Real podcast is brought to you by Aptiv. Aptiv produces audio-based workouts created by certified personal trainers available through a mobile app. Aptiv makes the highest quality training available to everyone with a carefully selected group of certified personal trainers. You even get to pick the trainer who motivates you best and Aptiv has an in-house music production team who will create the music playlist perfectly timed to the intensity and pace of your training based on what your trainer sets you. Whether, wherever or whenever you want to work out at the gym, at home, outside, when you're traveling for business, Aptiv is ready to go. It's like having a personal trainer in your pocket. There are more than 2,500 workouts available on the platform and you can search by difficulty, music genre or duration so you can find a workout you love every time. And if that isn't enough to keep you moving, they have a 5k, 10k, half and full marathon training program available. Subscriptions start at $14.99 billed monthly or $99.99 for an annual membership. For a short amount of time, new members get 30% off an annual membership, which is just $69.99 for a whole year of unlimited workouts. Visit aptiv.com forward slash running for real. That's A-A-P-T-I-V dot com forward slash running for real with the number four. All right, Matt, four more questions for you, starting with, this should be interesting. Can you tell us about a photo that maybe was on social media or somewhere else, maybe just taken, that didn't quite show the full story? Well, I saw this and when you, you sent me this in advance, and I have to say that um, I'm kind, my wife and I are both kind of big on the real story. Mm -hmm. So we've posted like our children doing horrible things. So I'm not one for, for not doing that. Like, certainly I post plenty of like, Hey, I'm pretty happy today, but I honestly like, you know, I'm really, that's, I'm kind of big on like, just yeah. like letting it, letting it all out there. People seem to really appreciate it. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I get that too. Cause I definitely do a lot of those too. Okay. I cool. show, I show just, 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 just to, uh, just to tell you, like I showed uh, a few days ago, I showed my bank account, which was negative. I like showed it right on the screen. I was like, all right, it's out there. <laughs> well, that's brave of you to do so. And uh, you definitely have uh, passed the test with that question in this episode. <laughs> All right, what about a running for real moment for you? Okay, tell me what that means again. 
So something that only runners will understand, like this I can talk about um, as the day we were recording this, I was trying to use a stick to prop my phone up to take a photo of me running. But of course, as we all know, the stick always falls down. And, you know, that's a moment that only runners will get because they're trying to get a photo picture of them running, but, you know, they can't find anything to prop their phone up with. So something that only okay, runners get. get. Okay, so... Um... I, when I'm going to do any kind of run, say over five, right? Let's say anything in the eight to 10 or longer, I'll typically tell myself, okay, today is a 12 day, right? So I'm going to do six and come back, or today's going to be an eight day. I'm going to do four and come back. A lot of times when I get to four, I don't want to turn around because that seems boring. So I'll just keep going, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. Then I get to eight or 10 and now I have to get home. And so I call a Lyft or an Uber and I'm so disgustingly sweaty by the time they pick me up because like, that's when I sweat the most when I stop. Yeah. And then I feel really, really bad because I'm like <laughs> literally disgusting. It's Georgia. It's humid. Uh-huh. And they're always really nice about it. And I'm like, do you have a towel? Like I feel really bad. So, uh, I'm sure my fellow runners can understand what it's like <laughs> to get in someone else's car when you're disgustingly sweaty. Or like when you see a family friend after a race or after you've been running and they want to and they go to give you a hug and you're like, no, no, please don't, please don't touch me. (laughs) Like, you're like, I get what you're trying to do, but like, don't touch me. I'm disgusting. Or sometimes they will and you see them like pull away, like. Speaking of which, I want to say that if you're the kind of person that's like, oh, I don't sweat that much, then I hate you for it because (laughs) I sweat. (laughs) Okay, cool. Uh, What about a high moment for you when you're running? A high moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say lately I'm experiencing a lot of them. Um, I decided to uh, try hard in this last six months. It's also helped me lose weight. Um, and I set, I know runners will understand this. I, uh, I set a segment. Um, I just, I didn't really want to pick up. Po- I just wanted to pick up point, two points. So it wasn't a segment, but I created the segment on Strava. And then every week I try to beat it. Mm-hmm. Um, And I've already, like, I knew I could cut like a minute off, but I've cut a bunch of minutes off of it. And like, anytime I beat it, I'm effing thrilled. And I send it to a bunch of, I send it to a bunch of friends that like care. Hey, I'm down to 17 minutes. Yay. Yeah, that's definitely a good one. And uh, nice to have a high quite often as well. All right. What about, what do you tell yourself on the starting line of a race? (sighs) It's another good one. Um, Man. I'm trying to because I actually just raced on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting. I usually pick someone that I'm going to beat or that I want to beat <laughs> okay. because like, I'm yeah. not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to place. Right. And so it's usually like, okay, I'm going to stay behind that guy. So maybe it's maybe on the start, I just wanted to start. And then once we get going, I sort of pick my friendly rival. Don't you do that? No, because what if you pick someone like, you know, what if you're standing on the start line and you pick someone who was, I don't know, an Olympian? I don't know, but what, no, no, once you get into it, once you're in that first mile, okay. you're like, okay, I can't, like for me, I'm always looking for people my age, mm. right? Because I'm, it's the age group placement, right? Okay. And I'm 46, which is super hard to tell because you can look 38 or you can look 50 and be in that 45 to 49 year old range. So that's what I'm usually thinking of during the, during a race that I care about. I'm absolutely trying to beat everybody my age. Okay. That's, no, that's, I, that makes sense. I guess for me, I, I'm looking at it in a slightly different lens that I mostly knew everyone who was around me. Like I knew oh. the names. So, you know, right. that's kind of how it was. And I haven't raced properly since, since uh, having Bailey. So I'm not sure. All right. Um, Matt, how can people find out more about you? How can they um, stay in touch in the future? Uh, well, I am Matt B Davis, M A T T B is in boy Davis on all of the platforms. And then obstacle racing media is also super easy to find, uh, on all the channels, you know, it's spelled differently on Twitter, but who cares? Uh, obstacle racing media, you can Google that or put my name in and I'm super, super duper easy to find. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your honesty, for being a voice, for being brave and sharing this out and and for helping all those people that you have. Um, it truly makes a huge difference in this world. And, um, you know, thanks for, for being a major part of it. Dude, awesome. And I do want to say, yes, please, if you heard this, please reach out to me and say, I heard you on Tina's podcast and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And if you want me to share it, I will. And if you don't, I'll just keep it between us. But that would be great. Cool. I definitely encourage people to do that, Matt. It's very easy to talk to in case that wasn't already obvious. 
All right. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Powerful stuff, right? Matt is being really brave sharing his experiences and I have a feeling he's going to help a lot more people in the future with his story. And if you are interested, I can put you in touch with Matt if you let me know. You can email me tina at tinamuir.com and I'll put you in touch. I apologize if this episode was triggering to anyone and I also apologize for the swearing or the bleeping. But I thought it was a topic we had never discussed, but I really feel that we should have. It's really important and to be honest, I was pretty clueless about a lot of it and I have a feeling many of you were too, so it's kind of educational as well. So maybe in the future we can be a bit more considerate, especially when our loved ones will need it the most. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes at tinamio.com forward slash episode 79. And for those of you who after today or in the past have signed up for my Patreon to support me through Patreon for all that I do, for the emails, for the podcast, for the Tina for Real podcast, for the Instagram posts, all of that stuff. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It means so much to me. Next week, we have British athlete Amelia Gorechka on the show, who has a ton of British records as a junior and is still going strong as an adult. And she may have run 1507 in the 5K and had no injuries for 10 years. Yes, you did hear that right. But she has struggled in recent years and has decided to do a complete rebuild of her body and her form to make sure she does come back on top. We also talk about her scoliosis and how that's affected her training. It's a great episode and I look forward to hearing what you think. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.